truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, folks. Look, the topic of today's uh, podcast is going to be industrial policy. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, what the heck does that mean? Well, it generally means government trying to uh, make the economy do things. That's uh, generally what it means. We're voting um, this week uh, in the House on a bill called the Competes Act. And I'll give you a quick summary of that. I'm going to bring in an expert uh, named Adam Thierer to, to help us work our way through this and what industrial policy actually is. Um, So what's in the Competes Act, first of all? Uh, A lot. Uh, Hundreds of billions of dollars of spending. As as you can imagine, it is the Democrats, after all. Now, some of the stuff in this bill, I think, is quite good. There's a lot of bipartisan competitiveness legislation um, that addresses things like uh, supply chain issues, education, workforce training, that kind of thing. But added to that bipartisan legislation is an enormous amount of pork and partisan legislation that uh, really comes down to corporate welfare in many in many respects. That's what more conservatives uh, would say anyway. Uh, there's there's all sorts of slush funds. I have a long list here, which I don't really don't feel like reading. Um, I want to talk more generally about industrialization policy because, it, look, it is popular um, at first, right? It's one of those many policy mechanisms that sounds good, um, but it's not clear that it does good. Uh, so I want to bring in Adam Thierer to to talk on this uh, subject. Uh, Adam, thanks for being on. First of all, uh, appreciate appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for having uh, me. Yeah, and I want to, I want to just quickly uh, give the audience your credentials here. So you're a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, I serve on the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Artificial Intelligence Commission on Competitiveness, Inclusion, and Innovation. You're a member of the Federalist Society's Regulatory Transparency Project. You've authored several books on the subject. Uh, you were previously president of the Progress and Freedom Foundation, former director of telecommunication studies at Cato Institute, and um, you know it's quite the you've got quite the pedigree on this on this subject. So. I kind of want to start from the beginning, help the audience understand what do we mean when we say industrial policy? Was was my was my definition, uh, my layman's definition <laughs> about right? Yeah, it was. I, I think generally speaking, there's a lot of different definitions of industrial policy out there. But the best and most concise one is government action focused on targeting specific technologies or sectors with governmental assistance of some fashion. It's an effort, an intentional effort by government to steer and or direct resources to sectors or technologies that otherwise they feel might not get enough of them. So as you pointed out, this raises the potential for, well, a whole lot of trouble because at some point government can get a bit out of control with said assistance and you then end up with the bill like the one pending in the house right now, which let's just give your listeners the the ugly details. We're talking almost 3000 pages a bill that requires a summary that is 109 pages long and which contains $250 billion worth of spending in the Senate companion measure. Again, that's a quarter trillion dollars and just so many extraneous provisions. I I saw the Republican study committee came out with a summary of it this week that said that the term coral reef is mentioned more times than China in the bill. (laughs) I'm not sure what coral reefs have to do with competitiveness, Congressman, but uh, there it is. That's the kind of uh, extraneous and, and silly sort of pork and, and other uh, nonsensical things that are in this bill. So so a, a, a fundamental question here is what is wrong with industrial policy? Because it sounds good to a lot of people, uh, especially in the wake of COVID, when we realized that our medical supply chains were not what they should be. People are concerned about chip shortages. Uh, you know, it's hard to get new cars these days. So, you know, people are hungry for, and this is maybe a populist sentiment, but people are hungry for some kind of government action. And, and it's, uh, it's politically popular to, to go for that action. Uh, how do we explain to people that maybe that's misguided? Yeah, well, the problem with industrial policy when it's focused on trying to pick winners and losers is that government's just not very good at that. It's hard for a government to foresee which sectors or technologies sometimes are going to be needed or be developing. Um, Also, the very act of engaging in the sort of 
industrial policy winner picking and steering of the economy can result in really large distortions and a large waste of taxpayer resources and and money. I mean, when we're talking about a quarter trillion dollars here, that money doesn't just fall like manna from heaven. It has to come from somewhere, and that's out of the pockets of taxpayers or uh, out of corporate uh, taxes or something. And so there is no free lunch. Something has to pay for all of that. And then the question is, does it really do any good? Um, when all right, we'll look at the past track record of industrial policy, both here and abroad in many countries, it's just not very effective when we get to the more highly targeted forms of it. Do you have any examples of how this has been detrimental to uh, policy? I mean, you, you've written about how we did it right when it, came, when it came to the digital revolution, that we basically put this policy blockade between the new and the old. And as a result, America has the leading tech companies in the world. Of course, we're all mad at them right now. <laughs> it's a different subject. Right. Um, but nevertheless, they outcompeted everybody else. Um, you know, where where else have where what are examples of good intentions gone wrong? Yeah, well, uh, there's quite a few, and we shouldn't just focus on America. We should look at the world. And when I first started out 30 years ago doing public policy analysis, I was actually an industrial policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation, and I did a lot of work on trade and industrial policy. And our big concern then was Japan. And there were a, was a lot of talk about the sort of a second Pearl Harbor in Japan sort of being the new rising force. And there were even Hollywood movies made about the threat of Japan and its industrial policy. Well, that didn't really work out so well for Japan. But at the time, a lot of American uh, policymakers and pundits were saying, we need an industrial policy to counter the Japanese threat. And so we did a lot of huffing and puffing, a lot of debating, and there were people smashing Japanese electronics on the steps of the Capitol with sledgehammers and crazy <laughs> things like that. But at the end of the day, we did not adopt a grandiose industrial policy regime to address the so-called Japanese threat. And what happened to Japan? Well, their industrial policies, which were widespread and very targeted, ended up resulting in a lot of boondoggles. Uh, they did get out ahead of us on some sectors, like high definition television and certain other electronic schemes. But at the end of the day, they wasted billions. And ultimately, the, the Japanese government itself, after the failure of most of its industrial policies, announced around the year 2000 that that sort of Japanese model of industrial policy was, quote, the source of our failure because there was so much effort by government to steer resources into backwards looking companies or technologies or sectors that ultimately did not prepare it well for the future. And then again, as you just noted, as I've written about what was America doing at the time, we were thinking about the future. We were thinking about what was next, not about yesterday's high definition broadcast analog signals, but about the digital internet and the connected world of computing and all that it entails. But we didn't do that through a central plan. We didn't try to outplan the Japanese, just as we didn't try to outplan the communist uh, SS USSR, and we shouldn't try to out China China. That's not the American way. Yeah, and, and look, and that's what the the, the critics of of, I guess of our conversation w w would say is, well, China is doing pretty well. They they have a, w w I guess, what you would call a state corporatist industrial policy. Um, now, is that good in their long term? I think that remains to be seen. But uh, they they've certainly risen faster than anybody expected in the last couple of decades. So like, how do we how do we contend with that claim? Yeah, that, well, that's a good point. So let's unpack that a little bit. And let's not just focus on China, but let's also talk about how other Asian economies made their gains in the post-war period. Uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and even to some extent, Japan, they did make significant gains. They did really have an industrial uh, renaissance of sorts. But why was that? Was that because of grandiose industrial policy? No, it was really because these countries were ready to do some catch up modernization. They had a lot of room to grow, especially following a bad World War II experience in Japan and other countries. And that was really China in, in the 90s and 2000s. The communist system had so repressed their creative people and minds and companies that when they finally opened up and allowed for a little bit more innovation and trade, they really benefited from it. Now, of course, they didn't really play by the rules when it comes to global trade. And they're engaged in a lot of shenanigans, including a lot of industrial policy stuff, 
post-2005. That's when the industrial policy stuff really kicked in in China. But the big gains China made were because they did open themselves to the world and started trading mostly with us. You know, we, we some people complain today, all the stuff we get made in China that we get here, but that's really the secret sauce that unlocked growth in China. They engaged with us. And so it brings up another topic and, and is, I don't know if this is considered industrialized policy or just protectionism, but I think they're in the same vein. And because look, a lot of, a lot of people would understandably argue that we, China doesn't have the same standards as we do. They don't have the same environmental regulations or labor regulations. They have slave labor for God's sakes. Um, so they can outcompete us and free trade doesn't really work when you're dealing with somebody who, who's not on that same playing field. Um, and as a result, we lose manufacturing capabilities. We see our, our, our you know, Midwest Rust Belt towns uh, decay into nothingness. That, that's a problem for a lot of people and it's because it's right in front of us. Um, so, you know, is there a degree of protectionism that is, is justified in the, in the face of um, these uncompetitive practices from abroad? Well, I think the better way to approach this very legitimate problem, Congressman, is for us to think about how we can get a sort of coalition of the willing to take on China and to try to get them to abide by the rules of the road when it comes to international trade. If we're going to have global engagement with other countries and, and even sometimes competitors, we need to find a way to play by a common set of rules. Now, that was the hope that we had with the World Trade Organization and the GATT structure. And we know that that hasn't worked out perfectly. It doesn't mean we should turn inward and become completely isolationist, however, in the in the face of that threat. We need to find partners. We need to have essentially sort of like a NATO for trade kind of an approach where we get people together and say, look, if the Chinese are not going to play by our rules when it comes to like engaging in, say, uh, telecom equipment and they're going to even spy on us, hey, it's time to maybe kick them out or mm -hmm. penalize them in some other way. And we did that. That's what the Trump administration did. And so we need to find ways like that to address breaking the rules without breaking the system in its entirety. Well, that's a big theme in conservative politics these days. I mean, we get so frustrated with whether it's China or the left that a lot of people on the right are willing to break our own rules and break our own principles and institutions and values just for the sake of that short term win. And I, I find myself increasingly alone trying to fight that battle. <laughs> do, do, you know, do, based on what you just said, do you think that getting out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, was a mistake? I mean, that was a bipartisan effort after uh, to torpedo that. Whether Hillary had won or Trump had won, right. both were going to torpedo that thing. But that was inherently a, an anti-China effort. Yeah, I, I thought personally that was unfortunate. I, I continue to be a believer in trade and engagement, and I think it does help our long-term strategic interests, but I understand there are other conservatives and folks who would disagree with that statement. But the reality is, is that I think we've had previous historical experience about a strong turn internationally towards isolationism and self-dependency, and the experience has not been good. There are benefits to engaging with actors, including sometimes bad actors like China, and trying to find ways to get them to play by a better set of rules. I am not one to say that's easy. I would never say that. And there's no doubt the Chinese need a lot more encouraging and a lot more penalties potentially to get them where we need them to be. Um, but it, going back to our primary focus of this conversation, the question is, does that then justify quarter trillion dollar big pork barrel spending efforts in the name of competitiveness yeah. that spend more time, you know, pandering to unions or Green, green New Deal efforts or coral reef restoration than having to, anything to do with reindustrializing America or competitiveness. And I don't even know what they mean by it. I mean, you, you have a you have this uh, tens of billions of dollars for grants for supply chain uh, resiliency, let's call it. I don't know what that means exactly. Do, I mean, do you know what it means? I don't. That's a great question. <laughs> because I don't. I don't know. Like, let, let's say I'm the king and I have billions of dollars to spend to make a supply chain stronger. I mean, I've, I talk to business leaders all the time. Supply chains are very complicated. A lot of it's out of our control. Um, they they have started to because they've seen the problems too. They've started to make these long term investments to, to for more resilient supply chains, more diversified supply chains. I, I actually don't know what me giving them money would do. 
I don't think it would do much, Congressman. And I think the reality is, is you say like, well, if you were, you know, czar for the day, well, we have a president that's behaving like a czar sometimes when it comes to supply chains. And he's ordering a lot of people and industries around and playing politics with it. I mean, we see a lot of provisions in this industrial policy measure and in the Build Back Better effort that are basically sort of union pandering and like a lot of really difficult strings for companies to deal with when it says, okay, here's some subsidies for you, semiconductor industry. But oh, by the way, everybody gets to, you know, unionize there and you can't pull back on union contracts for X number of years. Um, so unsurprisingly, politics is being played with industrial policy here. But I get your point and I agree with it. I don't really know what they mean by supply chain resiliency, except to say, it's just going to be more politicization of business decisions about the future, which, you know, I, I just don't believe government has a crystal ball to predict what the future needs are going to be of our supply chains. It can handle basic infrastructure things. That's a different issue, you know, getting our shipyards right, getting our rail lines, things like that. But beyond that, planning for supply chains, most companies can't even plan for supply chains 18 to 24 months out. It's really hard. And COVID, of course, was a massively disruptive thing that really threw our supply chains for a loop. So we're learning to be more resilient. We are re rebounding now, but resiliency as defined by government, I'm still not sure what that means. Well, it was also interesting you pointed out in some of your writing that uh, companies like Intel just announced major investments in, in chip making in Ohio, for instance. And so like, it, it seems clear that the, pri the private sector is not stupid. They, they understand that the problems with Taiwan and all of these issues with supply chains, that it looks like they're better positioned to take quick action. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and another important point to, to, to piggyback on what you just said, Congressman, is the fact that not only is the private sector taking these actions and you know reinvesting and finding ways to, to shore up these uh, supply chain deficiencies, but they're doing it faster than government probably ever could. Because even if this industrial policy measure passes now, what we know from government procurement and spending uh, practices is that it takes a long time to sort of spin these dials and sort of figure out how to allocate these, this, all this money. And so is that really going to help with the problems we confronted with today? I, I sincerely doubt it, but we're going to end up spending a lot of money anyway and probably poorly throwing it around on a lot of non-problems. Uh, th this conversation is going to be a lot shorter than I want it to be because we've got about six hours of amendments to vote on, uh, <laughs> no starting, which I think already started. But um, but I do want to finish with what does good industrial policy look like? Um, because there are some things in this bill that are certainly good. It's just yes. unfortunate that, as always, the Democrats, um, it, it's like they prefer to pass zero of their objectives as opposed to just <laughs> some of them um, that right. we can agree on. Um, but there are some yep. good things, right? Absolutely. So first of all, I, I don't have many qualms with basic R&D expenditures. If we're going to have government spending money on research and development, more basic is better than more targeted, generally speaking. You mm -hmm. know, broad based science I'm right. all right with. We also have many obvious needs in the military and law, uh, law enforcement world that we have large budget for, as we should. We should be spending on you know strategic needs that our military and law enforcement has. And that does give government a chance to spread money around to where they think it is most needed to make supplies uh, chains shore up or whatever. Third, uh, I think we need to focus on potentially addressing bad industrial policy from the past. We have industrial policy measures and regulatory regimes in place for a wide variety of technologies from energy to aviation to communication to many, many other sectors, food and drugs, that ultimately did not serve the industrial policy purpose they were put on the books to accomplish, whether it was competitiveness or consumer choice or whatever. We need to clean up yesterday's messes to understand that is part of industrial policy. Fourth, there's a whole other area, taxation, right? Taxation is separate than industrial policy, but it affects industrial policy. This is why the Europeans have struggled so mightily, despite all their grandiose industrial policy plans, to try to build national champions and tech companies. They fail because they overregulate and they overtax, and that means they get less capital and less uh, ingenious people to move there. Because if we know one thing, the history of capital and innovation, it's that capital and innovation and innovators flock to where they're treated most hospitably. This is still why America is a great hub for innovation, because despite our problems, we get these things right more often than say the Europeans and other countries do. Yeah, that's clear. Hey, what about um, workforce training and education yeah. in the STEM fields? 
And those are the best provisions of the uh, of the of the Competes Act. Probably we we have many provisions related to worker training or retraining, to STEM, to to basic types of educational matters. That I think if those were just pulled out and as a standalone thing, I think you'd find widespread agreement among everybody on all sides of the uh, of the aisle. And so it's it's perplexing to me that we need a three thousand page bill to accomplish some very commonsensical things. But this is the way, unfortunately, all too often Congress works creating extraordinarily large measures and then creating a Christmas tree approach where everybody gets a present under the tree. And that is just a, a really dysfunctional and outrageously expensive way of going about addressing narrower needs. I, I pray that we don't govern that way. I think um, Republicans will take control of the House in 2022, and I hope we don't do the same mistakes because look, it'll still be a divided government. And the question we're going to have to answer is the same question that the Democrats refuse to answer, which is, do you want to get some of your stuff done? Or do you just want, to, or do you want no one to get a present under the tree? Right. Because that's basically what happens with all of their priorities, which, by the way, has been very good for the country and for us. But when we're in charge, we cannot make the same mistakes. It just, <laughs> it just seems obvious. I, I hope that's right, I, and I, I think that there's a good chance we will learn from this experience because there's a chance that these sorts of things won't pass precisely because we've packed them full of too many, you know, uh, miscellaneous and extraneous things. I mean, I, I do wonder if we're going to be able to conference all this and get it done when it's 3000 pages of all of these different things. But, you know, we'll see. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But but as it stands right now, this is uh, this is a big turkey, in my opinion. It's just uh, stuffed with all sorts of things that it shouldn't be. All right. Last question, because it's kind of fun here uh, about flying cars. You've written about flying cars. Yeah. OK, so where's my flying car? Because <laughs> I was promised as a 90s child that by the when the 2000s came, it was the future and I was going to have flying cars and it was going to be great. But you say they've they were they were within our grasp, but it were regulated out of existence. Yeah, that's that's right. It's it's a tragic story. I mean, American innovators had put flying cars not just on the drawing board. They had put them in the air. We had this technology in the 30s and 40s, and of course, World War II interrupted some of that to some extent. We had to focus on big bombers and fighters and stuff. That made sense. But after that, we had a combination of overregulation and uh, a lot of trial lawyer activity that ultimately overregulated and sued a lot of these innovators out of existence. And then we had a culture of safety that, while completely understandable, ultimately discouraged a lot of the risk taking that would have allowed for flying cars and other types of transportation technologies to get off the ground and into the air. So as I always try to say, generally speaking, permissionless innovation is what's made so many American uh, companies and sectors great, but we just unfortunately don't have it for every sector. And aviation technology, flying cars, is a prime example. It's funny because uh, we were drafting a bill that instructed the administration. This is under the Trump administration, but I would I would go for the bill now as well. Um, and I forget which agency within government really would handle this. Probably a combination of the FAA and uh, the highway uh, agency, whatever that's exactly called. But instruct them to develop regulatory frameworks for flying cars. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna solve traffic, you got to put people in the air. I don't see any other way. It's way too expensive to put them underground, and uh, it, it's not that crazy of an idea. That's right, but we need to experiment, right? We need trial and error, and unfortunately, if we don't allow it, we live in a world of innovation arbitrage. People are going to move around. They're going to move to other countries, and that's unfortunately what's happening with a lot of the driverless car uh, innovation and experimentation, and with drones. We're starting to see it happen in you know Canada, Australia, England, uh, China. And many other countries, it, we have made it too hard in certain sectors, transportation, energy, food and drug medicine, to do bold sort of moonshots. And then in other sectors like digital technology, we're like, hey, this is great. You can go do anything, right? You don't need a permission slip from, from Uncle Sam to do it. We need to make that sort of permissionless innovation ethos be more the law of the land for many, many other sectors and technologies if we hope for that innovation to happen here in America and not over in China or other countries. You know, an analogy I like to use, and unfortunately I have to end with this because uh, they called votes about 20 minutes ago. Um, analogy I like to use is, look, everybody wants the car to go faster. Um, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, we want, the, we, want, we want to get to our destination faster. Let, let's assume that we all have the same goal. That's not always true, but let's assume we do in this case. Democrats say, look, just just make the car engine bigger. Just add more money to it and it'll it'll be faster. Republicans point out, yeah, but there's all these stop signs on the road. 
why don't we just spend no money but remove the stop signs? Maybe we can spend some money and um, fix the potholes in the road or the speed bumps that are causing us to get there slower. It doesn't matter how much gas you put in that engine, it's not going to get there faster unless you fix the framework with which it operates. And um, maybe that's a good way of explaining to people the, the political philosophy differences that we have. Yeah. Amen to that. I couldn't have said it better myself. Adam, I, I, we could talk a lot more about this. You've got a lot of great knowledge and you're well spoken on the subject. I really appreciate your time. Fortunately, I got to so cut it a little shorter than I would have yeah. liked. Well, thanks, thanks so Adam. much for having me, Congressman. I really appreciate hey. it. Oh, no, I appreciate right. you.